you give me the heads up when you're ready. Yep, it looks like you're ready. Well, let's start our study with a word of prayer again. Father, it truly is by you alone that we come to you this evening, Lord, asking that you would reveal to us your truths. Lord, as we've talked about so many times, these things were written for our learning, our understanding, Father. And we've already seen many examples. My prayer is this evening that we would see the exact information you want us to receive to continue to grow us into your image. So, Father, I do ask for your blessing on the study. I ask that you would guide and direct the study. Pray for the technology, Father, that it would work the way you want it to work. Through your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, good evening and welcome again. If you have your Bibles with you, I would encourage you to turn to Ezra chapter 3. And tonight, we're going to be working through chapters 4, 5, and 6. But before we do that, I want to really get a little bit of review and kind of set the stage for where we left off uh, last time in our study. Because as we're going to see, it's going to continue to build on what we looked at previously before we get into a kind of another section. As I had mentioned previously, the book of Ezra is kind of broken into two main sections. The first section is going to be focused on the physical rebuilding of the temple. We're going to see that played out or completed this evening. And then we are introduced actually to Ezra. And that's really focused in chapter 7 and on, on the people themselves and the rebuilding of them. We're going to see a little bit of that tonight. We've already seen a little bit of that. But that's what we're going to see kind of as an overview of the book of Ezra. So where are we in our study so far? So if you got your Bibles open here to chapter 3 of the book of Ezra, let's pick it up again in verse 8. I want to read through this kind of to the point where we left off. So it kind of sets the stage of what we looked at previously. We're going to talk about some points that we saw because, again, they're going to be applicable for this evening. So if you have your Bibles open to Ezra chapter 3, let's pick it up here in verse 8. Now, in the second month of the second year of their coming to the house of God at Jerusalem, Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, Jesua, the son of Josadak, and the rest of their brethren, the priests and the Levites, and all those who had come out of the captivity to Jerusalem, began work and appointed the Levites from 20 years old and above to oversee the work of the house of the Lord. Then Jesua, with his sons and brothers, Cadmiel, with his sons, and the sons of Judah arose as one to oversee those working on the house of God. The sons of Henadad, with their sons and their brethren, the Levites. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests stood in their apparel with trumpets. And the Levites, the sons of Ash, and the, with cymbals, to praise the Lord according to the ordinance of David, king of Israel. Verse 11, and they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord. That's what they said. For he is good. His mercy endures forever towards Israel. Then all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. So we'll hold up here for just a second and discuss this a little bit. So what we've seen so far is that the the children of Israel, under the proclamation of Cyrus, was told to go back and start construction on the temple. Well, so far, up to this point, all we really have seen is that the foundation, as we read, that's all that's really completed at this point. So clearly, they're making some progress, but that's all the progress that's happened up to this point. Now, a couple of key points we saw last week. Well, again, only the foundation was in place, not the whole temple at this point. With that being said, well, we saw clearly the importance of properly building a foundation or a properly built foundation and the parallel for the Christian life, the necessity of it being on Christ alone. The very thing that we sung in one of the songs we looked at tonight in worship or sung was that very thing, that it needs to be in Him in Him alone. That was one of the key takeaways in last week's study. Now, we also saw something else, and we're going to see it played out a little bit more this evening, but they had proceeded in their own strength. 
they weren't really directed through seeking the Lord. What we don't find is them consulting, hey, Lord, uh, we know that we had this decree to come back and do this. How do you want to do this thing? We didn't see that yet. We'll see that change a little bit this evening. Well, with that being said, their priorities were not focused on him. Now, this is where it really connects to the book of Haggai, where we looked at that. And we're going to see that referenced again tonight, or him specifically referenced as a prophet in his word. So that's going to be kind of interesting how the book of Haggai will play into our study. But specifically, that's what Haggai rebuked them of, was, hey, you guys are concerned specifically about your dwelling places, yet the house of the Lord is in shambles. So he directed that. We saw that. The big takeaway, or one of the big takeaways we saw very clearly from last week's study, is who is controlling the timing. There's such a parallel to what we looked at in the book of Esther. Remember that amazing story in the book of Esther that we, when we went through that, we saw the sights and sounds presentation, as a matter of fact, but um, just supernatural timing how God worked out the events. That's going on here too. God's got a plan, just like he has with you and I, and he is controlling the timing. Well, a couple other things that we saw from the study was not only is the temple being rebuilt, but as I said, the relationship or their relationship with God is also being rebuilt. And they've got a block of instruction. And this is really where the book of Haggai plays into this again. The prophets told them very specifically, Haggai, Zechariah, specifically that, hey, this is what is important, your spiritual relationship with the Lord. Well, they got a block of instruction. Well, what we're going to see tonight is now there's going to be the setup or there was the setup for the period of testing to come. Now, as I said, there's two types of rebuilding going on. There's a physical and there's a spiritual rebuilding. Well, why? It's the same lesson he's been teaching them all along, all the way back from when they came out of the land of Egypt. It's the same lesson he's teaching us, and that is dependence, or that our dependence would be on him and him alone. That's such an important part of the study. That's the lesson. How does that work? Well, as we saw and as was stated, it's simply by faith in him, by trusting him by faith. So picking up back here in verse 12, because we stopped here at verse 12. We got two more verses here in this particular chapter. Look what it says here now. But many of the priests and Levites and the heads of the father's houses, old men who had seen the first temple, wept with a loud voice when the foundation of this temple was laid before their eyes. Yet many shouted aloud for joy. So we got some people that are really happy, shouting for joy about this joyous thing. But then we have the old, the older people that had seen the previous temple that were sad and they were actually weeping. And the point that came out of that last week is it's not just for the the physical grandeur of the temple. It wasn't the same. Something was missing, and what was brought out last week is so key to what's going on here. The Lord's presence was not in the temple. Well, it hadn't been completed yet either, but we don't see it returning either. That's something that's going to be very different this time regarding the rebuilding the temple. So question for us is, where are we going this evening? So a little bit of kind of an outline for tonight. So following the teaching moment, following the block of instruction, Well, as we know, then comes the test. That's what we're going to primarily see tonight in chapters four and five, is that they're being tested. Opposition is going to come. How are they going to handle that? That's what we'll see this evening. In the latter part of our study tonight, we're going to see the completion of the Lord's work. The temple is completed, but it's completed after the block of instruction. And that's so critical for us to understand as it will be for them. So chapter four, picking it up here in verse one as we break some new ground. Now, when, well, let's finish up verse um, 13, sorry. So the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout and the sound was heard far off. That brings us to chapter four, verse one. Now, when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard 
that the descendants of the captivity were building the temple of the Lord God of Israel. Well, let's hold up there. So immediately here in chapter one or chapter four, verse one, we see that Israel is facing some opposition. There's adversaries. In other words, enemies of Israel, those that were opposed to the Lord's plan and direction. So before we even go any further with tonight's study, we see some immediate application here for us. There's always going to be opposition to those who are doing the Lord's work. This has been the way it has been all the way back into the garden until this time now. There's always going to be those who are going to oppose the Lord's work or those doing the Lord's work. Well, how do we know this? Well, as I said, there's countless Old Testament examples we could think of, of where the Israelites were opposed or yeah, all sorts of different people. But specifically, even more so than those Old Testament examples, well, Jesus himself tells us this very thing. As we think about that, just a couple examples may come to mind. And we've looked at these verses actually quite often recently, but the one that comes to mind is what he tells us in John chapter 16, verse 33. He specifically tells us, in the world, you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I, speaking of Jesus, have overcome the world. So that's not a maybe. That's not, well, perhaps. Very clearly, Jesus tells us that in the world, you will have tribulation. We know this. I think that any Christian that's been walking for any length of time has seen this. There's opposition every day to our daily walk with him. Maybe it's even yourself in your desires. But Jesus said that there will, in the world, you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, he has overcome the world. Well, again, from John, just a chapter before that, I encourage you to read John chapter 15, because it goes into a little bit more detail here, too, than what I'm going to give you tonight. But John 15, verse 18, Jesus says again, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. And he goes on to explain the relationship with the world specifically and why it hates him and why um, we're then hated. But specifically here again, the world's going to hate you because it's opposed or you being a Christian, you being a follower of the Lord, it's opposed to what the world wants to do. So here again, in verse one, we see that, well, Judah is exactly in the same situation. They also or have adversaries, adversaries who are opposing the work regarding building the temple. So let's get a little bit more here. So those opposing the work, they came to Zerubbabel and the heads of the father's houses and said to them, let us build with you, for we seek your God as you do, and we have sacrificed to him since the days of Esarhaddon, king of Assyria. Who brought us here? Well, notice the strategy here from those who are coming to oppose. Now, we're going to get a little bit more information as we read on here about really their motives and what they're trying to do specifically. But notice the strategy that they use when they come to Zerubbabel. They say, hey, we are like you. We want to help you. The problem is with that statement is that they are of the world. And because they're operating under this understanding of the world, their motives are of the world. That's what the problem is with this. We are like you, we want to help you. Well, this is in some aspects, really kind of an application of what we read in the New Testament of masquerading as angels of light, right? So they're looking like something that is good. Hey, we wanna help you build this temple but they have alternative motives. It's not just because they want to help. We're going to see that here in a minute. Now, again, very specifically, we as Christians are told very specifically what our relationship with the world is to look like. Well, again, from John, you know, we're told specifically that we're to be in the world, but not of the world nor are we to rely on the world for our strength. 
we're not to rely on the world. We, we have had a heavenly storehouse. He's given us everything for life and godliness. We're not to rely on the world's methods or the world for our strength or for our help. It should be from God and him alone. Now, we're also told in the New Testament very clearly that from James 4, 4, that friendship with the world is enmity with God. That's what our brother James tells us, the direct word from God. You can't be a lover of the world and be a friend of God. It doesn't work that way because as this verse tells us clearly, well, friendship with the world is enmity with God. Now, one more place from the New Testament, we're actually going to turn there and look at this specifically because I think it kind of has a direct application. It's actually um, a quote from an Old Testament scripture, Isaiah 52, verse 11. But if you would, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17. So way over to the right, to the New Testament, to 2 Corinthians. We looked at this not too long ago when we actually went through um, our 2 Corinthians store, um, study specifically. But it's a New Testament principle, but it's built on an Old Testament teaching. Israel would have understood this because it's throughout the law. It's, it kind of mimics or displays the law to some degree. I mean, the law is kind of captured in this about coming out and being separate from among them. So if you're at 2 Corinthians chapter 6, we'll pick it up here in verse 11. Now, in context, this is specifically for what the Corinthians were going through, but it also applies to us and it applies to what Israel was going through. Well, Paul writes to them, O Corinthians, we have spoken openly to you. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you're restricted by your own affections. I want to hold up there because, I mean, that, that's what the world is. The world is self-seeking. At the time, the Corinthians were also self-seeking. They were concerned about them, not the things of the Lord specifically. So Paul is going to deal with that or address that. He says, now... In return for the same, I speak as to children. You also be open. Now look what he says here in verse 14. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Now a lot of times, right, you've probably heard well-meaning teaching saying, hey, this is just talking specifically about marriage. Well, it, it is talking about marriage, but not specifically and certainly not in context. It applies to every situation, any relationship with the world would qualify here. He says, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? So as we're reading through this, think about what's going on with Israel right now. Hey, the world has came to them, approached them, said, hey, we want to help you. The problem is, is that the Israel is supposed to be seeking the Lord. The world's not seeking the Lord. They're seeking themselves. So he continues here in verse 15. He says, In what accord has Christ with Baal? Belial, excuse me. Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? That's what's going on here with Israel. Well, he continues. He says, And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? The answer is there is no agreement. For you are the temple of the living God. Now, that's such an application to where we talked about or what we talked about last week, that we are the temple. That's where God's presence dwells within us now through his Holy Spirit. He says, for you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. That's why there's not a physical temple anymore. Because his presence is in us. He says, therefore, so what do you do with that block of instruction? He says, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. That's the Old Testament principle. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Let's take verse 1 here of chapter 7, too. He says, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So 
that's what we're told. That's the understanding we are to have. That's why Israel is in the position they're in. Specifically, so if you turn back to Ezra chapter 4 here. So here we see the adversaries of Israel coming to them, offering to help. So what is Israel's response? Well, this time Israel chooses wisely. Look what he says in verse 3. But Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the heads of the father's houses of Israel said to them, you may do nothing with us to build a house for our God, but we alone will build the Lord, his covenant name, Yahweh, God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. So you see here, the response was, no, you're not going to help us build the temple to our God. This is our project for our God. This is a mark of maturity in Israel because that hasn't been their past experience. And we think back to some of the stories as they were coming into the promised land specifically, and they didn't. They relied often on the world and it got them in trouble and they made um, treaties and different things like that with different tribes or different people groups. And it didn't go so well for them. It was a problem. Well, this time Israel says, no, you may do nothing with us to build a house for our God, but we alone will build to the Lord. Amen. That was their work that was commanded by the Lord for them to do. Now, it's interesting here that Israel does choose wisely. It is a mark of maturity. They're not relying on the world for their strength, but yet they're still not there in their understanding entirely. Look what they say here at the latter part of that verse. They said, but we alone will build to the Lord God of Israel as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. So it's interesting, that last little part there specifically. They're trusting in the Lord and following his direction. But maybe we ask ourselves a question. Are they stand, trusting in the Lord and following his direction? Or are they standing behind the power of the world in King Cyrus? That last little part there that was added was a bit troublesome. Yes, that is the truth, and yes, the decree, and yes, the Lord was working through King Cyrus. But as King Cyrus and the king of Persia has commanded us, well, has not the Lord commanded you? Is that not who really is doing the work, even though it's through King Cyrus? Well, it's kind of an application point, again, for us as well, for us to consider. You know, whose strength are we leaning on? Are we leaning on God's strength plus the world's strength or plus the government's strength? No, it should be on the Lord and the Lord alone. Because the problem is, is that things fail, especially when it comes to the world's strength. The government's going to fail. We've seen that happen before. We're seeing it kind of happen now. The Lord will not fail. King Cyrus will fail them at some point. We'll see that a little bit later here in our study with once King Cyrus is gone and out of the picture. Well, it's not, they don't have the same thing. They get stopped. My point is, is it's so important that our strength needs to be in the Lord and on him alone, not on the Lord plus this or that. Well, look what happens here in verse four. Then the people of the land tried to discourage the people of Judah they troubled them in building and hired counselors against them to frustrate their purposes all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia as well. So now the testing gets a little bit harder. We see specifically there's a couple tactics that the enemy was specifically using for the people of the land. Well, they were trying to discourage them. Well, we see that when we see problems in the world. Well, they were troubling them. They're making it difficult for them to continue on. And they were causing, as we just read, frustration specifically for them. As it said here in verse 5, to frustrate their purposes all the days of King Cyrus. So again, we got to ask ourselves, well, wow, you know, the command went out for them to build the temple again. 
it's what the Lord wanted them to do, but they're facing opposition. Well, who's really in control of the situation? I would submit to you, it's wholeheartedly the Lord. He has a plan, and he's working in Israel to bring them to see his perspective. Same can be true for us. If you find yourself in a situation like this, think about the circumstances or consider the circumstances. Take them before him and ask him, Father, what do you want me to learn? You know, oftentimes we want things to happen as fast as possible, right? Oh, we want to be delivered from this trial or we want to, things to be the way they used to be. Have you ever considered that maybe the reason they're not happening in the time that you think they should happen is because the Lord has a plan. And that timing, that, that delay from our perspective is for our own benefit because the Lord's teaching us something. He's bringing us to his understanding. That's often why trials and tribulations come is for that very reason. That's exactly what's happening here with Israel, much like he did with Esther, as I talked about previously. The Lord had a plan. The Lord had timing. He had it all worked in his timing. Same goes for what we're seeing now. Well, now a bit of time is going to pass as we just left off. Well, a new king's going to be in charge, King Ahasuerus. Now, that name should ring a bell for us. We've looked at this. This was the king that was alive or that was reigning during the time of Esther. It was the one that Esther was actually married to, King Ahasuerus. We spent a lot of time talking about that specifically back in the book of Esther. So that's the time frame we're looking at specifically. In verse 6 here, he says, In the reign of Ahasuerus, in the beginning of his reign, they wrote an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah in Jerusalem. In the days of Arxaxerxes, also Bishlam, Mithredeth, Tabal, and the rest of the companions wrote to Arxaxerxes, king of Persia, and a letter was written in Aramaic script and translated into Aramaic language. So what's going on now? Well, the opposition continues. The testing has gotten harder. Well, there's a new king on the scene following Ahasuerus, Arxaxerxes. Well, it doesn't seem like he has the same knowledge of the Lord that Nebuchadnezzar had or Cyrus had, or even Ahasuerus for that matter, as we saw in the book of Esther, or Darius that we'll read about later. He doesn't have that same knowledge, maybe. Certainly doesn't have the same relationship or the Lord's working in the same way through him. So verse 8 here, well, Rehum, the commander, and Shimshai, the scribe, wrote a letter against Jerusalem to King Artaxerxes in this fashion. So here we're going to see the letter that Rehum writes regarding the building or the people of Judah and Israel that are building this temple. So verse 9 opens the letter. It says this, From Rehum, the commander, Shimshai, the scribe, and the rest of their companions, representatives of the Danonites, the, Fars the Farsites, the Terpolites, the people of Persia and Erek and Babylon, and Shushan and the Davidites and the Elamites, and the rest of the nations whom the great and noble O-Snapper took captive and settled in the cities of Samaria and the remainder beyond the river and so forth. So here we're getting kind of the introduction to Rehum's letter specifically to Arxaxerxes. Well, notice what he said there in verse 10. And the rest of the nations whom the great and noble O-Snapper took captive. Well, what's interesting about that is these were the people that were also in captivity. So the other nations that were taken captivity when the siege happened, well, these are the people that are in conjunction writing against Israel. So they gives us a little bit of insight potentially to their motives as well. Hey, 
you know, this is kind of a prideful thing. Hey, what about Israel here? Why is Israel getting the special treatment and, and being able to come back to their land and, and build the temple? And, you know, as you remember from when we looked at Cyrus specifically in his decree, and they were getting money and they were getting building materials and the things that they had taken captive from the, ta the temple previously when it was ransacked. Well, they're getting those things back. So I think what's going on here specifically is there's a little bit of jealousy and pride, much like we see with Satan. That's always the world's motives, right? It's always about them. That's what we're seeing in play here. Well, let's keep reading here in verse 11. This is a copy of the letter that was sent him to King Xerxes from your servants, the men of the region beyond the river, and so forth. Let it be known to the king, that the Jews who came up from you have come to us at Jerusalem and are building the rebellious and evil city and are finishing its walls and repairing its foundations. Well, that's a true statement. That's exactly what is happening. Verse 13, he says, Let it now be known to the king that if this city is built and the walls completed, they will not pay tax, tribute, or custom and the king's treasury will be or diminished. So we kind of get a little bit into the, the insight that's going on here. Hey, you know, if, if we let this happen, oh, great king, you're, gonna, you're not going to get the tax money that you were expecting to get. And, you know, they're going to kind of be on their own. That could be a problem. Well, verse 14, now, because we receive support from the palace, it was not proper for us to see the king's dishonor. Therefore, we have sent and informed the king that search be made in the book of the records of your fathers. And you will find in the book of the records and know that this city is a rebellious city, harmful to kings and providences, and that they have incited sedition within the city in former times, for which cause this city was destroyed. So here we find a little bit more information that they're writing to the king on. Well, this is where some of this is true. Some of this is a little conjecture. So yeah, th that had happened in the past, but why was that? Well, specifically, Israel was trying to be captured for one, but they've never been a rebellious city from the perspective. They've been rebellious from the world's perspective to the world's way. But this was their land. They were taking captive their land, if you remember from back when we looked at that in Second Chronicles. Well, he continues there. He says, We inform the king that if the city is rebuilt and its walls are completed, the result will be that you will have no dominion beyond the river. So they're really appealing to the king and saying, hey, if you let this happen, these people are going to run wild and you're going to lose your dominion. So look what he says and what the king's response was here. The king sent an answer to Reum, the commander, to Shimshai, the scribe, and to the rest of their companions who dwelt in Samaria and to the remainder beyond the river, peace and so forth. The letter which you sent to us has been clearly read before me, and I have gave command, and a search has been made, and it was found that this city in former times has revolted against kings, and rebellion and sedition have been fostered in it. There have also been mighty kings over Jerusalem who have ruled over all the region beyond the river and tax. Tribute and custom were paid to them. Now, give the command to make these men cease, that this city may not be built until the command is given by me. Take heed now that you do not fail to do this. Why should damage increase to the hurt of the kings? So here we find the king's response. So the king searches the records or has his people search the records, and it's found that, hey, Back in times before, well, yeah, Israel had captured other cities, and this has been a problem for us. And they were paying taxes to their kings, 
and tributes to their kings. And this could be a real problem for us if this continues. So as a result here, the king specifically says, progress is to stop on this temple and this rebuilding until the command is given by me. This last phrase there, until the command is given by me, is such an evidence of the precise timing that is in play here. The Lord had a plan, and the Lord was going to complete the Lord's work when the time was right. That's a necessary part of maturity, is that it's dependence on the Lord's time, not our time. It's so evidenced by his, until the command is given by me. He doesn't necessarily know why that is or whatnot, but the Lord has a plan. That's the takeaway here. So what's the result? Well, we get that in verse 23. Now, when the copy of King uh, um, Arxaxerxes' letter was read before Rehum, Shimshai the scribe, and their companions, they went up in haste to Jerusalem against the Jews and by force of arms made them cease. Thus the work of the house of God, which is at Jerusalem, ceased. And it was discontinued until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So the result was, well, the progress on the temple is halted. But again, I draw parallels to what we saw in the book of Esther. In this particular situation, it kind of seems hopeless, just like it was in the book of Esther. The command went out, an irreversible command went out to kill all the Jews. Remember that? Well, it's kind of similar here. Progress on the temple has been stopped. The command has gone out by the king. Well, again, the question for us to consider, who is really in control? And as we think about that, and as it has been such a point of application for this evening so far, we need to ask ourselves, what should they do? Or what should, more specifically, what should we do when we find ourselves in this situation? Where the situation seems hopeless, where the world has seemed like it has overcame us, and the situation is not the way we expected it to go. Let me encourage you, the first and only thing we should do is inquire of the Lord. That's what we need to be doing. Lord, Father, I'm in this situation. We read this evening very specifically from John, Lord, that you said that you have overcome the world. What do I do in this situation, Father God? Because it doesn't seem like that to me. I am confident that if you ask the Lord that question, he will show you very clearly what he is doing when we submit to him. Now, as we continue here and we enter into chapter 5, well, again, time has passed. There's a new king in charge now. Well, King Darius is on the scene. So chapter 5, verse 1. Then prophet Haggai and Zechariah, the son of Ido, prophets, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. So now after time has passed, the work has been stopped. God's got a plan. God's doing this in his timing. Well, what happens? Well, God sent a word through his prophet, Haggai. Remember when we went through the book of Haggai, specifically a couple weeks ago on Sunday? Well, the one thing that we saw over and over again was the emphasis on the Lord's word on the matter. This really gives us the context behind the lesson and the word from the Lord. What were some of the things that we looked at or we saw specifically from the book of Haggai? Well, one, first and foremost, that comes away from that book is that the Lord must be first. First priority. That's what the first chapter was all about. Hey, you guys are doing other things. You're concerned about everything but what you should be concerned about. The emphasis or the takeaway from that was the Lord must be first. So when the word of the Lord is coming to Israel here, that's what's being told to them. Hey, the Lord needs to be first. Secondly, that we saw from the book of Haggai was very specifically that 
the emphasis on the I, meaning the I, meaning the Lord, will do this. That's the big lesson that Israel is learning here from the block of testing that they are going through. That, hey, the Lord's going to do this. You can't do this. He can do this. And he's going to work in a way, again, that's so supernatural and provide for them. It's a direct evidence, of, again, of that maxim we hear all the time. Where God guides, God will provide. God's, that's, God's got to be guiding here. Well, also, not only Haggai, but the prophet Zechariah also was giving them a word from the Lord. Now, we haven't looked at that book specifically yet. That will be coming here in future studies. But turn with me to the book of Zechariah. So we get a little bit of information as to what that prophet was telling them because it sets the context for what's going to happen next. So if you turn to Zechariah, it's one book past, or the next book past the book of Haggai. Zechariah chapter 1. Let's just look here specifically at the first four books, or four books, first four verses of the first chapter. Zechariah chapter 1, verse 1. In the eighth month of the second year of Darius, that's right where we find ourselves in our study here in Ezra, the word of the Lord, Yahweh, came to Zechariah the son of Berechiah, the son of Ido, the prophet saying, the Lord has been very angry with your fathers. Therefore, say to them, thus says the Lord of hosts. Look at this next part. If you underline, this is something to underline. Return to me, says the Lord of hosts. And I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. So again, let's look at that again. Thus says the Lord of hosts, return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Much like we see in the New Testament in James, just a little bit further where we looked at previously today in 4.4, 4, 4, in 4.8, he says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Well, what he's telling Israel is, hey, you guys have departed from your God, Yahweh. Return to me, and I will return to you. That's the block of instruction. That's what the prophets are prophesying. Well, he continues here in verse 4. He gives them a lesson. He says, don't be like your fathers, to whom the former prophets preached, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, turn now from your evil ways and your evil deeds. Sadly, I'm adding that for emphasis, but they did not hear nor heed me, says the Lord. That's, we'll hold up there if you want to turn back to Ezra here, but that's what Haggai and that's what Zechariah is telling them. The big takeaway is, hey, Israel, in this time of trial, you, the work of God has been stopped. The temple has been stopped. It seems hopeless. Return to him. Put him first. And the Lord will do the work. That's what the prophets are telling them, very specifically. So look what happens following that in chapter 5 of Ezra, verse 2. So Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, and Jeshua, the son of Josedach, rose up and began to build the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. And the prophets of God were with them, helping them. So now they're heeding the word of the Lord. The prophets have spoken these things to them. They've encouraged them. Hey, guys, the Lord is working here. So what happens to leaders? The leaders step up and return to work, even though they have been told to stop and time had passed. In addition to that, the prophets were there with them, helping them, as we just read. Specifically, they have a new focus the Lord, they're seeking to resume the Lord's work here. Well, at the same time, Tatnai, the governor of the region beyond the river, and Shetar Banzai and their companions came to them and spoke thus to them. Who has commanded you to build this temple and finish this wall? Now, we got to be careful with the inflection that we add here because we don't know how he said it specifically. 
But here is the governor, the one that was in charge of the region. Well, he sees that work is being resumed that was previously stopped. Tat and I is inquiring here, like, who gave you the authorization to proceed? Well, he continues here in verse 4. Then accordingly, we told them the names of the men who were constructing this building. So there was no lying here. There was no rebellion on the part of Israel. There was no opposition or, hey, this is what the Lord said. No, this is the people that are working on the temple. This is the people that are building the temple. They were open with them, transparent with them. Well, look at verse 5. But the eye of their God was upon the elders of the Jews, so that they could not make them cease till a report could go to Darius. Then a written answer was returned considering this matter. Are concerning this matter. So the eye of the Lord was upon the elders and the Jews. That was kind of the difference from what the foundational work looked like. The Lord's working because they're working in conjunction with the Lord. They're seeking the Lord now, as Haggai and Zechariah so strongly encouraged them. So as we just read, but the eye of their God was upon the elders of the Jews, so that they could not make them cease till a report could go to Darius. Then a written answer was returned concerning the matter. So now we get a copy of the letter. This is a copy of the letter that Tatnai sent. So he's sending this to the king inquiring about, hey, um, we, we got the situation down here. The Jews are building again. They're not supposed to be building. What do we want to do with this king? So Verse 6 here, again, we see who is really working behind the scenes. The Lord's working here. The Lord's got a plan. This is all part of his plan. He's going to work through King Darius, as we're going to so clearly read here. But in verse 6, he says, this is a copy of the letter that Tat and I sent. The governor of the region beyond the river, and Shetar Banzai and his companions, the Persians, who were in the region beyond the river to Darius the king. They sent a letter to him in which was written thus, To Darius the king, all peace. Let it be known to the king that we went into the providence of Judah, to the temple of the great God, which is being built with heavy stones and timber, is being laid in the walls, and this work goes on diligently. Gives you a little bit of insight. This is coming from the world's perspective or from the governor's perspective here. But as he observed, well, the work is continuing and it's continuing diligently and prospers in their hands. Then we asked those elders and spoke thus to them, who commanded you to build this temple and to finish these walls? We also asked them for the names to inform you that we might write the names of the men who were chief among them. And thus they, they returned us an answer, saying, We, look at the answer, we are the servants of the God of heaven and earth, and we are rebuilding the temple that was built many years ago, which a great king of Israel built and completed. So, in other words, Israel is saying, Hey, you know, we are the servants of God, and we are rebuilding. The, his temple, his house. Look at verse 12. It's such a key to our study this evening. He says, but because our fathers provoked the God of heaven to wrath. That is a huge understanding that they are coming to. That's exactly what Zechariah was prophesying to them. Hey, this is the lesson. You need to learn from this lesson specifically. Well, Again, verse 12, the first part of it here, but because our fathers provoked the God of heaven to wrath, he gave them into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, the Chaldean, who destroyed this temple and carried the people away to Babylon. However, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Babylon, king Cyrus issued a decree to build this house of God. Also, the gold and silver articles of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple, that was in Jerusalem and carried into the temple of Babylon, those King Cyrus took 
from the Temple of Babylon, and they were given to the one named Shezbazar, whom he had made governor. And he said to him, take these articles, go carry them to the temple site that is in Jerusalem and let the house of God be rebuilt on its former site. Then the same Shezbazar, which a lot of people believe may be Zerubbabel, just a different name for him that they would have recognized because we don't see his name come up other than here. But then the same Shezbazar came and laid the foundation of the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. But from that time until now, it has been under construction and it is not finished. Look at verse 17. Now, therefore, if it seems good to the king, let a search be made in the king's treasure's house, which is there in Babylon, whether it is so that a decree was issued by King Cyrus to build this house of God at Jerusalem and let the king send us his pleasure concerning the matter. So here, this guy, the governor, Tatani, he's coming at this a little bit differently. He's not necessarily opposing the work like we saw in the previous chapter and the previous test. He's inquiring, hey, king, I'm not certain that this is supposed to be happening. I'm not certain that this decree actually exists like they say it does. He was not aware of it. So he's asking the king, King Darius at this point, to go search the records and see specifically if or not there was actually a decree made. So that's what Tatani's letter to Darius is. Now, still of the world, it's still the world, but it's a lot different than what transpired some 15 years ago that's passed now from when this work had started previously. This brings us to chapter six. Now we're going to get Darius's response to Tatani. So look at this, such an evidence again that the Lord, only the Lord is the one that could be doing something so supernatural. Then King Darius issued a decree and a search was made in the archives where the treasures were stored in Babylon. And at Armetha, in the palace, that is in the providence of Meda, a scroll was found, and, it, and in it, a record was written thus. Very similar to what we saw in the first couple of chapters of our study here so far of Ezra. Verse 3 says, In the first year of King Cyrus, King Cyrus issued a decree concerning the house of God at Jerusalem. Let the house be rebuilt, the palace where they offered sacrifices, and let the foundations of it be firmly laid. Its height, 60 cubits. Its width, 60 cubits. With three rows of heavy stones and one row of new timber, let the expenses be paid from the king's treasury. Also, let the gold and silver articles of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar took from the temple, which is in Jerusalem, and brought to Babylon, be restored, and taken back to the temple, which is in Jerusalem, each to its place, and deposit them in the house of God. So that was the decree that they found previously wrote, very similar to what we read the first time. Well, now he's going to tell them to do something with that. Now, therefore, Tatani, governor of the region beyond the river, and Shetar Banzai, and your companions, the Persians who are beyond the river, keep yourselves far from there. That's interesting. That's such an evidence of the Lord working. Hey, uh, just stay away from there. Let the work of this house of God alone. <clears throat> Let the governor of the Jews and the elders of the Jews build this house of God on its site. Moreover, I issue a decree as to what you shall do for the elders of these Jews. For the building of this house of God, let the cost be paid at the king's expense from the taxes on the region beyond the river. This is to be given immediately to these men so that they are not hindered. So now we see that the work had stopped. It had resumed through the Lord's command and from his stirring up through the prophets now they're building again, and permission to build isn't just enough, but where God guides, 
well, God's going to provide for them again in a supernatural way. So not only is he allowing them to continue to build here, Darius is, but he's also saying, hey, we need to support this work. He says, do what as to what you shall, I issue, excuse, <clears throat> moreover, I issue a decree as to what you shall do for the elders of these Jews, for the building of this house of God, let the cost be paid at the king's expense from the taxes on the region beyond the river. This is to be given immediately to these men so that they are not hindered. In addition, and whatever they need, <clears throat> young bulls, rams, and lambs, for the burnt offerings of the God of heaven, wheat, salt, wine, oil, according to the requests of the priests who are in Jerusalem, let it be given them day and day without fail that they may offer sacrifices, a sweet aroma to God of heaven, to the God of heaven, and pray for the life of the king and his sons. So here he's saying, hey, whatever these guys need, whatever they need for sacrifices, you provide that for them so that they have that. And it's interesting here, as it's quoted, that they may offer sacrifices of sweet aroma to the God of heaven. Then we read that from scripture. Clearly, Darius knew something about the provision of the Lord. He also knew the power of the Lord. Look what he says here in this next phrase. And pray for the life of the king, that be himself, and his sons. So again, we see the world doing what the world knows how to do. Darius here is also, he's got some interest in this for his own interest, right? Well, pray for my life too and my sons. Well, he continues here in verse 11. He says, also issue a decree that whoever alters this edict, let the timber be pulled from his house and erected and let him be hanged on it and let his house be made a refuge heap because of this. And may the God who causes his name to dwell there destroy any king or people who put their hand to alter it or to destroy this house of God, which is in Jerusalem. I, Darius, issue a decree. Let it be done diligently. There is no other way to explain what's going on here other than the supernatural working of the Lord in his perfect timing. He issues a new decree. It's even better than the previous decree that was issued under Cyrus with the binder on it that nobody is to alter this degree or to go against this without strict and steep consequences. Guys, if that isn't evidence of the Lord working here, I'm not certain what is. Again, where God guides, he provides in his perfect timing. So, we see here in verse 13, well, Tatnai is going to do exactly as the Lord had, or as the king had commanded. Then Tatnai, governor of the region beyond the river, Shatar Banzai and their companions diligently did according to what the king, what King Darius had sent. So they obeyed. This is what the king said. This is what they did. Verse 14, so the elders of the Jews built and they prospered through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Ido. And they built and finished it according to the commandment of the God of Israel and according to the command of Cyrus, Darius, and Arxerxes, king of Persia. So here we see, according to the command of the God of Israel, that's whose standard they're working by now. This is the big difference where, from what we saw previously, where they were working under the command of King Cyrus specifically. So that's the difference here. They're seeking the Lord. The Lord is providing for them supernaturally. Well, verse 15, Now the temple was finished on the third day of the month of Adar, which is in the sixth year of the reign of King Darius. So now about 15 years or so since the time that they started with the foundation, the temple is complete. 
And what we find now in the last couple of verses here is that Israel's, well, they're offering thanksgiving and sacrifices, offerings in the dedication of the temple. Now, what we're going to see here and what we're going to read, well, if you look at the numbers and you go back and look at Solomon's temple and what happened during that dedication, this pales in comparison to Solomon's temple. I think there's a specific reason for that. Again, as we talked about, the presence of the Lord's not here in this particular temple like it was in Solomon's. But let's read about that. Verse 16, Then the children of Israel, the priests and the Levites, and the rest of the descendants of the captivity celebrated the dedication of this house of God with joy. And they offered sacrifices at the dedication of this house of God, 100 bulls, 200 rams, 400 lambs, and as a sin offering for all Israel, 12 male goats, according to the number of the tribes of Israel. They assigned the priests to the divisions and the Levites to their divisions over the service of God in Jerusalem, as it is written in the book of Moses or the book of the law. Verse 19. And the descendants of the captivity kept the Passover on the 14th day of the first month. For the priests and the Levites had purified themselves. All of them were ritually clean. They slaughtered the Passover lambs for the, all the descendants of the captivity, from the brethren, the priests, and for themselves. Then the children of Israel, who had returned from captivity, ate together with all who had separated themselves from the filth of the nations of the land in order to seek the Lord God of Israel. In other words, those that were not of true Jewish descent, but had separated themselves from the world and had became like, you could use the word, I suppose, like Gentiles. So here we find in verses now 16 or so through 22, well, Israel is keeping the Passover, or the Passover, excuse me, and the Feast of Unleavened Bread now that the temple has been dedicated and they're resuming the priestly functions. Which brings us to verse 22. And they kept the Feast of Unleavened Bread seven days with joy, for the Lord made them joyful. That's ultimately who's in control. That's who's doing the work. It's acknowledgement of who's doing the work here. It's the Lord. Yahweh himself that has made them joyful and turned the heart of the king of Assyria towards them to strengthen their hands in the work of the house of God, the God of Israel. Again, just so underscores who's actually doing the work here. It's the Lord that's doing the work. The Lord supernaturally worked through Cyrus, as he specifically said. The Lord supernaturally worked through Darius. I'm even going to submit to you, he supernaturally worked through those that were opposing Israel because he was doing something specifically in Israel. He was bringing them to his understanding. They needed to hear the message that the prophet specifically needed to tell them. <clears throat> so as we wrap up here this evening, we make a couple of final points and recap a little bit. We spent a good portion of our time looking at the spiritual condition of Israel and the need to rebuild. If you remember from our first um, study that we looked at, well, a couple of the main takeaways that we see from that this evening. One, opposition to the Lord's work will come, but God is doing something specifically. When that happens to us, he's also doing something amongst us as well in that. That's the perspective we need to have when we find ourselves going through difficult situations is that, Hey, the Lord's working in us. What does he want us to know in this situation? What did he want Israel to know in this situation? Well, specifically that he needed to be the one doing the work. He needed to be number one. Well, the second big thing that we saw from tonight's study was that God has a plan in his timing. Our response to that needs to be to seek him and to seek his direction first and continually and then stand fast in his provision for us. There's great danger, Christian, in relying on the world and the world's strength. We're not called to rely on the world. We're called to seek him first. 
rely on his provision. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, we do just come before you again. Just mindful of the things that you have said to us this evening, Lord. The things that you've shown us in your word. Once again, we've seen another example seen in Israel. Father, where they tried to do things in their own strength. But you had another plan and you were bringing them to your understanding. Much like you're doing to us. Father, we said from the very beginning of our study that we too are in a season of rebuilding as we are being transformed into your image. Father, may we be patient. May we rely on your timing. Father, as we saw so clearly as well, that we would not rely on the world for our strength, but would rely on you alone. Father, as we continue, Lord willing, next week through the remainder chapters or through the next chapter you bring us to, Father, that you would continue to instill in us your lessons and what you want us to know. Father, that we would see the examples and not be the examples. Father, again, I'm so thankful for what you're doing in each and every one of us. I ask you very specifically, Father, that you would continue to make us a church that you want us to be. Grow us into you for your son. It's through your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, with that,